Marine Corps Junior ROTC, Sergeant Major Clark here with another period of instruction. Today we're going to cover something that's very, very important to me and very, very important to Marines, and that's the proper care, wear, and maintenance of our uniforms. Marines take pride in themselves and the title that they've earned, and one way that they can show dignity and respect to that title is by wearing their uniforms properly, maintaining them, and caring for them just the same way as they would maintain and care for their weapon systems. They're going to save their and other Marines' lives in combat. The purpose of this period of instruction is to provide you a lesson on the utility, the service, and the physical training uniform. It's going to provide you information on the proper care, wear, and maintenance of the utility, service, C, and physical training uniforms. Before you're done with this class, you're going to be able to properly wear and care for your PT uniforms, your camis, and your service uniforms. Well, at least that's my hope, and that's our goal. So let's start off with a few key words. Your first key word is regulation. Our Marine Corps has a ridiculous amount of regulations, which simply means that we're going to put everything in a book, in a binder, spell it out for you so that you know when and where to follow along. Serviceability means that that item is good enough to be used and perform in its function. So if you've got a uniform item that's ripped or torn, it's not good enough to be used and it's not going to serve its proper function. A mandate is a particular policy or rule or a task that you're given the authority to enforce. So what that means for you is our mandate is that you follow the uniform regulations. So I'm wondering what you already know about uniform regulations. We've got cadets that honestly couldn't tell the difference between a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine if they were lined up side by side in uniform right in front of them. And that's okay, no worries. We've got other cadets who could tell you the history of every single uniform, of every single service, of every single country since the dawn of time. So just take a step back, think about what you saw and what you heard the first week or two as it relates to the uniforms that the senior Marine instructor and the Marine instructor are wearing. And if there's anything that pops in your head during uniform issue, the issue of the uniforms that we had, was there any other cadets that helped you out? Were there any discussions from the Marine instructor or the senior Marine instructor that you already have had on the subject of wear and care of the uniform? So let's dive in. You're going to hear me say this from the time you walk in the door for the very first time as an LE1 to the day you walk out of my classroom and graduate as a senior. And that's that the wearing of the uniform, it says should. I'm going to tell you it must be a matter of personal pride to all Marine Corps Junior ROTC cadets. you got to understand that you're setting an example of orderliness and conformity to our uniform regulations. By your appearance and how you wear your uniform, you're setting a proper example, not just for other cadets in the program, but for other students in the high school. Your personal appearance in uniform must project an image to others that are seeing you around the school, in the parking lot, at our organizations, and our functions, that you are a part of the world's finest organization. What organization, you might ask? Marine Corps Junior ROTC. Marine Corps Junior ROTC headquarters mandates, wink, wink, that's that key word, that cadets wear the Marine Corps Combat Utility Uniform. At a minimum, you've got to wear at least one uniform. And for us, it's going to be the Combat Utility Uniform. You're going to wear your physical training uniform. That's another mandate that we're going to have for you. Now, beyond your camis or your combat utility uniform, or you can also call them MARPAT, which is the digital pattern, MAR being Marine, PAT being pattern. Beyond the combat utility uniform and beyond the PT uniform, we can ask or assign or dictate that cadets are going to wear different types of uniforms. For example, if we have other uniforms that we're able to issue everyone, meaning we've got a, a surplus of uniforms, then we will go ahead and issue those out to our returning cadets. Now, we don't normally issue out anything other than camis to our LE1s, but because our budget allows, because we've got competitions and because we've got graded events, 
LE2s and above are going to get issued service uniforms and maybe dress blues. And then if you're on one of our competitive teams, like the drill team, then you will get issued a dress blue uniform. But those are a case-by-case -case basis. Color guards require different types of uniforms and other school and public events. You will be mandated to wear one version of the uniforms, which you should have already learned in your previous period of instruction. In order for us to make sure that the cadets that come beyond and pass you as you move up and more LE1s come in, you have to take care of these uniforms in order to maintain serviceability. Serviceability means good quality, in good condition. Is it serviceable, meaning I can take it from you after getting it back in the dry cleaners and then reissue it to someone else in good condition or in a serviceable condition. So we're going to start off with the easiest uniform to maintain in inventory and then move up to the most difficult. First one we're going to talk about, physical training uniform. Era. Your physical training uniform is going to consist of a green general purpose trunks and green t-shirt. So you'll get a plain set of, they're kind of like running shorts, and you're going to get a plain green skivvy shirt. That skivvy shirt can be worn in PT gear. It can also be worn underneath your blouse in a camouflage uniform. We're not going to have any designated unit distinguishing marks. Marines are not allowed to have anything on their green t-shirt unless it's authorized, and then it becomes what we call organizational PT gear, meaning a Marine Corps unit or an ROTC unit wants to identify themselves collectively separate from another unit that might be similar. So they might come up with a logo or something like that, and they'll put it on the shirt, but they have to have authorization from their commander to do so. Now let's talk about maintaining your physical training uniform. You're going to throw your PT shorts, your green shorts and your green shirt in the washing machine on warm or cold water, just like you would any other uh, laundry item. Make sure you're not washing it with whites or anything else. You want to make sure that you're washing it on the washing machine on permanent press or gentle cycle. You got to become familiar with the dials and the buttons on your washing machine. Mom and dad don't get to do your laundry for you anymore. Only use mild detergent that doesn't have any brighteners or bleach. Hey, listen, these green shirts fade really easy if you're putting a load of clothes in that has brighteners or bleach in it. Make sure that you wash your green PT gear separately from your other clothes, especially if they're new because those green dyes can bleed into your other clothes or that nice dress shirt that you just bought that hasn't been washed yet, those dyes can bleed into your uniforms. We've had cadets show up with a really weird red tint to their uniforms because they wash their greens with a set of red clothing. Make sure you rinse them. Make sure you dry them. You're gonna go ahead and use a tumble dry on medium or low heat. Don't put it in there for like four hours on super high 1000 degree heat because you're gonna shrink your uniforms. Don't use excessive heat. Like I said, it's going to fade them and it's going to shrink them. Make sure you pull your uniforms out of the dryer immediately and hang them up. All right. Your undergarments, your PT gear, make sure you pull them from the dryer immediately. Fold them up. That way you don't get any wrinkles. Next thing we're going to talk about is the combat utility uniform. The one that you're going to wear as an LE1 most often the one that all of you, regardless of LE level, should be the most familiar with. So you want to make sure that your camis fit. Your utility should be semi loose fitting and comfortable. You should be able to move around in them. Now they shouldn't be skin tight. They're not form fitting or semi form fitting like your service and dress uniforms are, but you don't want them as big as a circus tent either. Now, you as a cadet are never going to tuck in your blouse to your trousers. However, you may see pictures out there of Marines that have their blouse tucked into their pants or their trousers, and that's just because of the tactical environment that they're in or the gear that they have to wear or the equipment that they have strapped to them. Those are only on rare occasions, but that's for Marines only, not for cadets. You also want to make sure that your uniforms match one another. And here's what I mean. 
You should not have a brand new dark green, dark brown blouse and then a really old faded pair of trousers. They should match, the, the fade of them should match. You may already be aware that we roll our sleeves in the summer and we use the daylight savings time calendar as our cue to roll them up or let them down. Sleeves will be rolled with the sleeve inside out, not like the Army or the Air Force where you see the green cuff. We want to see the inside of the blouse rolled in the sleeves. Now, your sleeves should form a roll about three inches wide. Four finger width is a good rule of thumb, and you want to make sure that they stop at least two inches above the elbow. So the bottom of that roll should be no closer to your elbow than two inches. In the winter, you're going to make sure that your sleeves are unrolled. Pretty simple. You just take care of your uniforms like normal. You steam out your sleeves, make sure all your buttons are buttoned, and we will, on daylight savings time, unroll our sleeves. You're going to make sure that your cuff at the wrist is buttoned. Here you can see the Marine on the left has his sleeves down during the fall daylight savings time, and the Marine on the right has his sleeves rolled for summer or spring daylight savings time. Now, don't worry about the desert digital utilities. You're not ever going to get issued deserts. Now, here's a great picture of two very solid, very squared away Marines and their sleeves. I've got a video out on our YouTube channel. There are other videos on our webpage that show you exactly how to roll the sleeves. There are a lot of ways that Marines go about rolling their sleeves. But if you take a look, the inside of the sleeve, the lighter portion is what we see. Your roll should be about three to four inches wide. Now that's about four finger widths. Now I understand that some of us have little bitty baby hands and others of us have giant sausage hands. Four fingers is a rule of thumb, three to four inches wide. And you want it very, very tight around your arm. You should not be able to get more than a finger or two in between your arm and the sleeve roll itself. You want to make sure that you're about two inches from your elbow. The top of the elbow up to the bottom of the sleeve should be about two inches. You're only allowed to wear a green skivvy shirt underneath your camis. We will issue those. However, if you go online to any of the military issue type websites, you can buy more green shirts on your own as long as it's one of the versions that we allow. Just hit me up in class, hit the major up. We'll give you some of the more popular vendors. And honestly, you could buy a pack of three uh, for the same price or cheaper than what you would buy a replacement item from us here in ROTC. Your web belt has to be worn. Now you'll notice when we're in boots and use PT gear, when we're wearing our bottoms without our blouse, the senior Marine instructor and I have a Marine Corps martial arts belt. You're not authorized to wear your Marine Corps martial arts belts because you don't get one until you become a Marine. You're not authorized to wear any other type of rigging belt or harness in your combat utility uniform. There are all kinds of boots out there that are desert and tan. You don't get to go buy your own Oakley boots with a zipper on the side and little pouches for your little snacks and everything that's weird about those crazy lightweight ninja boots. But some exceptions can be made on a case-by-case -case basis if for whatever reason you have a teeny weeny little elf foot or a giant giant Sasquatch foot and maybe we don't have the boots in stock. If you and mom and dad get with us, we may, on exception, authorize you to go buy a similar boot that's comparable to the Marine Corps Combat Utility boot. But you gotta ask us first. Here's an example of a green skivvy shirt. There's an example on the right side of your screen of a McBap belt, Marine Corps Martial Arts belt. You will wear the belt in the bottom left-hand corner, that's your web belt. And then your boots that are issued to you must have an eagle globe and anchor branded on the outside of the heel. Those are only the types of boots that are authorized by the Marine Corps. Like I said in the previous slide, case by case basis, if we don't have them in stock and you 
want to purchase some on your own because you've got a, a size 19 foot, hit us up and we'll work through that and problem solve. So you're going to get a class on how to properly blouse your trousers. What that means is you're going to cuff your trouser leg or your pant leg at the bottom near the boot a couple of times, depending on the length of your trousers. And then we're going to give you boot bands. I'll show you those here in a second. It's kind of like a little rubber band. You're going to blouse your trousers at or above the boot in a very neat manner. So that's going to prevent you having a bundle of extra material fumbling and bumbling around at the bottom of your ankle. You have to use issued boot bands. Don't get caught wearing like rubber bands or your sister's hair ties or any of the types of the army boot band cuffs. They're not authorized. A good rule of thumb is to make sure that you blouse your trousers, your pant leg above the boot or between the first and second eyelet of your boot. You're trying to make sure you have like a tapered or narrowed look. You don't want a straight leg pant leg like you would wear your blue jeans over your cowboy boots. That's the opposite of what we're going for. And any excess material that's at the bottom of your cuff of your pant leg, you're going to roll it up very similar to how you would roll your sleeves on your blouse. And then you're going to use your boot band. So if you take a look in this picture right here, if you take a look at the top, those are pictures of what your pant leg, aka your trousers, are going to look like when you use the boot bands. Those boot bands are the little green hooks on the bottom right. If you look at the bottom left, you'll see the Marine using a cuff to roll the excessive material up. And then he's going to take those boot bands that are sitting on the bench next to him, wrap them around his ankle, and then flip the material underneath. You got to take care of your uniforms. Like I said, mom and dad aren't going to do the washing and the drying for you. So how do we take care of our Marine Corps Combat Utility Uniform, AKA camis? You're going to wash them in warm or cold water, just like you do your PT gear. I would always recommend cold water for the first go arounds. Warm water can sometimes uh, fade your uniforms, but it's not required. You're going to make sure you're like your PT gear, it's on permanent press or gentle cycle. You're only going to use mild detergent, no brighteners, no bleach. You're going to wash them separately from your other clothes. I would always recommend where your, when you wear your PT gear and you get all stinky and sweaty, just wash your camis and your PT gear together. Make sure that you put it through a good rinse cycle on that uh, machine setting. You got to be careful when you're drying your camis. Dry them on a medium or low heat. Don't use excessive heat because that's going to fade those camis. And then uh, you're going to end up having to be financially responsible for them because they're light yellow instead of dark green because you dried them in excessive heat for like four hours. Pull them from the dryer immediately. If you leave your camis in the dryer, they're going to wrinkle. And it's going to be more difficult to press your camis when it comes time to get ready for an inspection. So I will always pull them right out of the washer and then put them into the dryer. Because if you live in the washing machine, they're going to wrinkle as well because they're going to sit there and they get moldy. So right when I pull them out of the dryer, I take them and hang them up on the hanger immediately if I'm not going to be going right, right to the uh, iron and ironing board. That's going to prevent all your wrinkles. You want to make sure that you hang dry or air dry if your dryer is busted. You don't have to use a dryer. Sometimes I, in order to prevent fading, if I've got time on my hands, I'll take my camis out of the washing machine and I'll just let them air dry. That's going to make them last a bit longer. But if you do put in the dryer, pull them out immediately and hang them right back up. Make sure that you are following along in the videos that have been published on our webpage and our YouTube page on how to properly press your combat utility uniform. You are authorized to press this uniform. And I'm telling you, it's highly recommended that you do so. That way you don't show up to an inspection or show up to school walking around looking like a wrinkle bomb. That's going to get you in some hot water. You want to make sure that you're using light starch or magic sizing. Magic sizing is not starch, but it still will hold a little bit of a press in order for you to become familiar with ironing if you're not used to it. And then as you get used to it, go ahead and switch to starch because it'll hold that press a lot longer. Spray your starch on the entire uniform and let it dry. You got to rub that starch in and then let that uniform dry completely again. 
You're going to steam out all of your wrinkles with an iron, and you're going to put that iron on dry. Click it off the steam, put it on dry, and then iron that and dry that uniform flat. Make sure at a minimum that you're at least steaming the wrinkles out and then clicking the uniform, I'm sorry, clicking the iron on dry to press your uniform. That's, that is whether you're going to use starch or not. Make sure you're at least steam pressing them. You're going to make sure that you use the same approach to pressing your cover that you do your camouflage utility uniform. However, that bill has cardboard in it. Please follow along on our additional video that's published on how to properly press your camouflage utility uniform. You're going to wash your camouflage utility cover by hand. You can put it in the washing machine, but put it on a gentle cycle. Do not put it in the dryer because that cardboard bill is going to get ruined. So how do we know that we're wearing our uniform properly? Well, let's start with the cover. You're going to make sure that your hat, a.k.a. your cover, because it covers your head, is going to be worn when you're outside. If you are inside in some type of ceremony, there will be times where we would tell you you're going to have your cover on because that's part of that uniform. But your rule of thumb is when I walk outside, I put my cover on. When I walk inside, I take it off. I'm going to make sure that the bill of the cover rests atop of the bridge of the nose. Now, a good rule of thumb is to take your booger finger and your middle finger, the one you point at people with and say, shame on you, the one that you flip people off with, stick them together, and then rest those fingers at the top of your nose. Your bill should rest on top of your fingers, which are sitting at the top of your nose. But the actual measurement is one inch above the bridge of the nose. Like I said, use the two finger rule. The back of the cover is not going to rest any lower than the crown of your head. So if you reach up and smack yourself in the back of the head, you're going to feel that weird knot thing that everybody has. That's the crown of the head, where the top of your head rounds out to the back side of your head. You're going to make sure that the, the rim or the ridge, the sweatband, if you will, of the cover doesn't get pulled back down below the crown because it's not a ball cap. Now... When you're on your way home, ooh, I got my license, I'm 16, I get to drive to school now. You're going to make sure that if you are wearing a uniform, that you're wearing your uniform properly with your cover on your head. However, it's not a requirement to have your cover on in your vehicle because it can sometimes restrict the vision in uh, your vehicle when you're driving. So it's not a requirement. Here you can see... On the left hand side, one inch above the bridge of the nose, that sweat band. If you look at the Marine on the left, he can stick his fingers up between the bill of his cover and the bridge of his nose. And then on the right, you'll take a look. You can see the crown of the head. If his cover was pulled down any lower and it got any closer to his ears, he would be out of regulations. It's not a ball cap. It's not a cowboy hat. It's a cover. It's a uniform item. If for whatever reason, you're issued uniforms that may or may not be fitting or ill-fitting, then you can refer to this chart and we can get you swapped out for new uniforms. Here's where you're going to hear the term for the first time, gig line. Gig line. It's like a fishing term. It's naval terminology. But when you wear your camouflage utility trousers, you're going to wear your web belt. Now, when I'm wearing the belt, the belt tip, that little shiny gold part, is going to be on my left hip and the buckle is going to be lined up with the edge of the crotch. Make sure that you have your gig line aka often referred to as military alignment squared away when you're wearing your uniform. When you get issued your belt it's going to be really really long so we're going to show you how to cut your belt. When you are doing it on your own do not cut the belt tip off. You're going to take the belt off the buckle and then cut the belt on the opposite end from the belt tip. But in order to ensure that it's being worn properly, you're going to ensure that it's between two to four inches, no less than two, no more than four inches from the belt buckle to the edge of the belt tip. This is something you're going to see over and over and over again when you're being hit on your inspections. 
For those who earn the rank of cadet officer, you're going to make sure that you place your rank insignia one inch from the bottom of the collar, and you're going to ensure that it is center line of the collar, meaning equidistance centered from left to right, and that if I was to draw an imaginary line from the bottom of my collar up through my top collar where it meets my shoulder, then you're going to make sure that you're going to understand that that's your center line of collar. Most of you are going to be wearing enlisted rank insignia or chevrons. You're going to make sure that when you place those on there that you get it right the first time. You need to use a ruler. If you don't, you're going to poke about a bazillion holes in that collar. It's going to become unserviceable. There's that key word again. And then you're going to end up having to buy it because you ruined it. You're going to make sure that you measure one half inch from the sides of the collar. Take a look at the picture on the left and you'll see where that half an inch is measured from side to side. Not straight up and down like an officer, side to side. And your center line is at an angle where an officer's center line is straight up and down. Your center line of collar measures from the bottom right and then straight up. So the pointy tip of that chevron, that rank, should be in line with what would be the pointy end of the bottom right hand corner of that collar. I know they're a little bit rounded, but you're gonna have to make sure that if you had the half an inch left and right, that it's also center lined. In order to properly place your chevrons on your collar, you're gonna make sure that you measure from the bottom corner of the chevron. If you've only got one stripe up, like the Lance Corporal on the right, it's relatively easy because you've got a very distinct bottom right hand corner of that stripe. If you're a staff and seal or above, you have to use that point where that rocker on the bottom, that rounded part, gets pointy and then meets up with the bottom stripe of your top three stripes. You're going to make sure that your lamps face inboard, meaning if I were to put my chevrons on my collar, the open spout or the lamp would be or where the genie would come out of the lamp has to be facing my chest on either side. You have to make sure that they're inboard, aka facing each other. Otherwise, you're going to get hit on inspection. And honestly, that happens more often than not. Even LE3s and 4s still will rush to get their chevrons thrown on and they'll put them on backwards. Now, a cadet's PFC or private first class chevron is very distinctly different than a Marine's. A Marine's is just basically one stripe. If you took a Lance Corporal chevron and took that genie bottle out, then you would have a Marine PFC chevron. We changed the way we are placing our PFC chevrons on in the past couple of years. So I want you to understand the new way you're going to measure it. You're going to measure from the edge of the handle. The most outward portion of the rounded part of that handle is where you start measuring from. And that's one half an inch from the handle. The other half an inch is measured on the other side where the spout is. That tiny little spout where the genie would come out a half an inch from the edge of the collar to the spout, and then on the other side, half an edge from the collar to the handle. There, you can see where your half an inch starts, and then your center line is going to be the cap at the top of the genie bottle. So if I was to reach down and pull the cap off and then look down inside that bottle, that's center line. That's what's getting placed center of the pointy edge of my collar. So up until this point, we discussed in detail all of the items that make up our PT gear uniform, how to wash them, how to care for them. We've talked about our camouflage utility uniform, all the items that make those up, how to wash them, how to dry them, how to care for them, and we've briefly gone over how to press them. So let's do the same thing for our service Charlie uniform. Your service uniforms are going to fit a little bit different than your camis in that they're semi-form fitting, all right, meaning they should be tailored to fit you, but they should still be comfortable. You don't want to be walking around in spandex. Males are going to wear a white skinny shirt or a white t-shirt underneath their khaki shirt, but females have the option. Females in the past never wore a white shirt underneath their khakis, but in recent years, the Marine Corps made it optional for females. It's not required, 
unless it's prescribed by the commander, meaning I want everyone to look identical in formation for military uniformity. And he might tell all the females, hey, we're going to be in service uniform. Make sure you got a white ski shirt on underneath your Charlie shirt. Easy day, no worries. Regardless of how cool you are with your untuck it type civilian shirts, you're not doing that with our khakis. The male shirt is going to be tucked in to the trousers. You're going to wear what we call shirt stays, which are these little suspender like things that you clip to the bottom of your shirt and then they will clip to your socks. Or if you have the version on the right, those are the ones that loop under your feet. We will issue one of the two of those sets and we'll show you how to put them on. Also, I've got videos on my webpage that show you how to use shirt stays on your military uniforms, but a lot of Marines wear them on their civilian attire as well. Any excess material in the back should be pleated, meaning it should be folded over and tucked in to the shirt stays. So here's what I mean by semi form fitting. You can take a look at the Marine on the left. It's kind of a stretched out picture. But you want to make sure that you got a very smooth appearance with that excess material. And you look at the senior drill instructor on the right. Even though he's twisting and he's probably knife handing or pointing at someone or hollering at someone, he's got that pleated or tapered look in the back. And his shirt stays, even though he's twisting and is trying its best to wrinkle, those shirt stays are what's keeping that shirt pulled down tight. Females will not, will not tuck in their khaki shirt. Your shirt is going to be worn on the outside of your trousers. Now, there are exceptions for females when it comes to tucking in their shirts. If they're on a color guard or if they have to wear a duty belt or if they're doing a drill evaluation and they're the unit leader and they have to wear a belt for their sword, then they would tuck in their shirt. But those are the rare, rare occasions and either the senior media instructor or I will be around to walk you through that. When you're wearing your shirt untucked as a female, the length of the shirt should rest over the hips, about mid pocket of the trousers. It should also come about mid crotch in the front and mid behind in the back. If it's too long, then let me know. If you can't cover the mid portion of your pocket with your khaki shirt, that means you've grown and we need to have those shirts exchanged. Well, you can take a look at the picture here of the drill instructor with the cartridge belt you may find those rare occasions where you would need to tuck it in as a female, but you don't do it on, an, on a day-to-day -day basis. Here's what I'm talking about as it relates to the length of your shirt. About mid pocket, about mid crotch, about mid rear end. If it comes down a little bit lower, that's fine, but I really don't want it to go any higher than that. All right, fellas, I need you to listen to me real quick. You're going to wear these trousers in a militant manner. They are not your My Chemical Romance Evo skinny jeans. They're not your rodeo cowboy wranglers. They're not your gangster jeans that you're going to wear around your ankles. These are a military uniform. So you need to make sure that you have that waistband on or above your hip bone. If you take your thumb and dig it into your side, you'll find your hip bone. You're going to make sure that the bottom of the web belt sits above your hips. Now, when you take these to the cleaners, and we'll go over this in a lot more detail when we start to get into fitting at the later portion of this class, but when you take them to the cleaners, you need to make sure that the slacks are long enough so that there's a slight break over the shoe at the front of the eyelet. So if you look down at your sneakers, the middle of your laces at the height of your arch is where the top of the the bottom of the trousers is going to rest on the top of the shoe. And then it should be in a, a slight angle going backwards to the heel. There's a variation, a tolerance, if you will, a mandate or regulation, if you will, wink, wink, key words, of a quarter of an inch above or below the welt of the shoe. The welt of the shoe is on the back side by the heel where the rubber sole meets the leather of the shoe. Now, when you hem these, there's not going to be a hem more than two to three inches wide. Now, this is going to have an exception to the rule. If we issue you uniforms and we start to run low, I may allow a little bit of variation in that, depending on how tall or how short you are and what we have in the inventory. You're going to wear issued black dress shoes, aka Oxfords. 
You don't get to go buy your own shoes. You gotta have, you're gonna have our patent leather shoes to be issued. Now, our females don't have belt loops, but their waistband is still gonna rest above or on the hip bone. Now, you're gonna make sure, as a general rule, that it is between your navel and your hip bone. You're also gonna make sure that your slacks have enough um, leeway or enough give so they slightly rest on the front of the shoe and the eyelets. But you have a variation of a half an inch as opposed to a quarter of an inch above or below the wealth of the shoe in the back. However, you'll find me recommending to all females that they don't get past that male quarter of an inch tolerance just to make your life a little bit easier. Females are going to make sure that the hem on their slacks is no more than two to three inches wide and uh, and that is the same as the male uniform. Ladies, you're going to wear uh, the same type of, a very similar type of dress shoe that the males do. You're not going to get issued pumps or heels. Female Marines have variations of uniforms where they're allowed to wear pumps or heels, but you're not getting issued a skirt. You're not going to wear pumps or heels. So taking a look at this picture probably will help you out with the incoherent rambling that I just gave you about the male trousers. Male trousers have belt loops and they have pockets in the back. Female trousers do not have pockets in the back. And then you can take a look at the bottom. That is where your uh, Oxford, that is what your Oxford shoe looks like. That sole where it meets the shiny black patent leather in the back by the heel, that's called the welt of the shoe. Our female trousers are made of the same material, the same gabardine material, but there are no pockets and no belt loops. And females have pleats in the front of their trousers. Males do not. So now that we know what uniform items we're going to get issued and when we get our service uniforms as an LE2 or higher, let's talk about how to take care of them. You're going to make sure that the first time you clean your service uniforms that you take them to the dry cleaners. The very first time you get issued to them, don't do anything to them yourself. Take them to the dry cleaners. Find somewhere that is familiar with pressing and dry cleaning uniforms. Someone that is used to doing firefighter, paramedic, EMT, police officer uniforms. Those types of dry cleaners will be able to help you out because they need to have military creases put in them. However, boom, once you get them back and those creases are put in, then you can, as you become more comfortable with them, maintain your own service uniforms. So if you are not wanting to waste a ton of money washing or your uh, dry cleaning and pressing your uniforms at the cleaners uh, week after week, month after month, then you can do it on your own. But if you're going to do it on your own, you need to make sure that you are machine washing them in cold water. Cold water. Do not put them in a warm or a hot water cycle. You're going to make sure that you're using a gentle cycle only. And I would recommend only putting in your khaki shirt and your green trousers. Don't wash anything else with them. You're only going to use a mild detergent that doesn't have bleach or brighteners. That's the same for all your uniforms. Now, you're not, I repeat, not going to put your service uniforms in the dryer. It will ruin them. So... If you've got ring around the collar, you can go ahead, if you've got stains on your uniform, you can go ahead and spray them down with any kind of uh, stain remover and then put them in the washing machine on cold water. But when that cycle is done, that gentle cycle, you're going to go ahead and pull them out of the washing machine and then hang them up to dry. Don't put your service uniforms in the dryer. Don't put your service uniforms in the dryer. Let them hang dry. So that means when you come home on Friday... You might have to take those Charlies off, do a wash, and then let them dry overnight. And then you can get into spraying them and pressing them on Saturday or Sunday to prepare for your Monday inspection. Spray and wash or non-chlorinated stain remover. Those are great ways to get stains and ring around the collar. If you become used to pressing your uniforms on your own, but you just can't get those stains out, go ahead and take them to the dry cleaners. All right, what I always use on a newer pair of service uniforms 
is Scotch Guard. Right when I pull it out of the package, I'm going to wash it in cold water or I'm going to take it to the dry cleaners and then I'm going to get it back and I'm going to spray it with Scotch Guard. If you got any questions about Scotch Guard, watch the video that I put out on pressing your service uniforms. I will always recommend that you dry clean your uniforms. Even if you're pressing them yourselves once a week, you need to take them to the dry cleaners once a month. If you're washing them yourselves and pressing them yourselves, make sure they are clean. Do not take them off after you've been all stanky and sweaty and then try to iron your uniforms because you're gonna ruin them. You're gonna burn the doo-doo stain into your uniform, the armpit stain into your uniform, and it's never gonna be getting out, and then you're gonna to have to buy a new one. If you're not comfortable, then just take them to the dry cleaners. All your uniforms, like I said, should be dry cleaned monthly regardless. Monthly regardless. Yep, I'm saying again, monthly regardless. If you're not familiar with pressing your service C, then take a look at that video that I put out. You're gonna go ahead and spray everything down with starch. After you pull it out of the dryer and you let it air dry, then you're gonna spray it down with an aerosol type starch. Do not use Stay Flow. Stay Flow is a very thick, concentrated, gooey type starch that you have to dilute with water. And if you're not used to pressing clothes, you will ruin them using Stay Flow. Now I have, and sometimes still use Stay Flow only because I've become so comfortable pressing my uniforms. But I would say use a canned aerosol. If you're not used to using starch, then use magic sizing first. You're gonna massage the starch into the fabric to eliminate any white residue, and then you're gonna allow those service C's to dry completely. So wash them on Friday, let them pull them out of the dry out of the washing machine, let them air dry, spray them down on Saturday morning, let them air dry, and then iron them Saturday night or Sunday. It don't take long for them to dry. And what I will always do is I will find that window in the house that has the sun coming into it, and I'll hang my uniforms in the front of that window so that they air dry a lot faster. You're not gonna press a flat crease into the chest of your service uniform like you do your camis. Your collar needs to be openly rolled and your lapels need to be rolled pressed. That means you're gonna lay it on the ironing board, iron it flat, and then let it roll open when you button it with that top button. Don't put a crease in your collar. You're gonna make sure that you press two vertical creases in the front and it, it should be measured from the shoulder seam to the center of the pocket from each, I'm sorry, from the bottom of the shirt. You're gonna press three evenly spaced vertical creases in the back of the shirt from the yoke seam to the bottom of the shirt. The yoke seam is that stitching that runs across the bottom. You'll see here as we roll to the next slide right here. So you have two creases in the front and three creases in the back. The yoke is that solid line that runs across the back of the shoulder blades. And then your three creases should be equal distance from the shoulder seam to the first crease, first crease, the second crease, second crease to the third crease, and then back to the shoulder seam. I always measure from shoulder, teens, shoulder seam to center shirt first, and then I will measure my left and right creases from there. Again, if you've never pressed a shirt before with creases, then take it to the cleaners first. And then once you've got those creases in there, bing, bang, boom, all you gotta do is press over those creases over and over again without putting second and third creases on the left and right of them. Those are called double creases. So here's what I mean about not pressing your collar flat. You're gonna flip that collar up and iron underneath it. Don't lay it on the ironing board and press a crease in the front where your button is. When you're pressing your trousers, you're gonna make sure you press a smooth vertical crease at the center front and rear of each leg. That means you've got a crease in the front and a crease on the back. Now, you're not gonna have creases that run from your belt loop all the way down to the center of your shoe. You gotta make sure that those creases start at the bottom by your shoelace of the front of your trouser and they come up to no more than two inches above the crotch seam. So where that zipper is at the bottom of your inseam, two inches above that is where you're gonna stop your crease. Now, you will use the bottom of your pocket on the side as a guideline because measuring two inches above the crotch can be a pain in the rear end. 
So you're going to use what we call a blunt stop to the creases. You don't want to have creases that run from the shoelace but portion of your trousers up through the kneecap, up through the thigh, but then start to fade away the closer to the top they get. Your creases shouldn't fade or disappear in the upper portion of your trousers. You're going to take the same approach, the same approach to pressing as, as you are spraying your trousers as you do your shirt. You're going to soak them down with starch. You're going to massage it into the fabric though, so there's no white residue. And then you're going to let them completely dry just like your Charlie shirt. Here you'll hopefully see what I'm talking about as it relates to your trousers. You can see that the Marine on the right and the left have the creases that run from the bottom closest to their shoe, very sharp and very distinct, all the way up to about two inches above the crotch. If you're trying to figure out where that is, then just use the bottom of the pocket to use as a guideline to stop that crease. That's a good rule of thumb. Makes it easier for you. Like your Charlie shirt, I recommend that your service trousers are pressed and dry cleaned the first go around, and especially if you're not comfortable pressing them. At a minimum, all service uniforms should be dry cleaned at least once a month, regardless. Now here's something that Marines and cadets alike both have a difficult time wrapping their head around. You can dry clean your garrison cover. I don't know why people don't or why people think they can't. You can dry clean it. It makes your life a lot easier because these things get nasty real easy. So when you want to press your cover, number one, you're going to follow the same guidelines and rules that you did when you pressed your green, your green trousers. You're going to make sure that uh, at least once a month you take it to the dry cleaners. However, there's one thing that's not on these slides that I would recommend, and that's that you uh, put a skinny shirt on top of your cover instead of taking the iron straight to the fabric. These covers are very, very thick and the material is doubled and triple layered. So those under layers where the seams are can burn through and give you a shine on your cover. If you don't put a skivvy shirt on top of your cover when you put your iron to it. Wearing your garrison cover is pretty simple. It's very similar to the way you wear your eight point cover in that you're going to have the point at the bridge of the nose one inch from the bridge of the nose that two finger rule we were talking about earlier in class the back is going to rest no lower than the natural crown same as your utility cover and you're going to make sure that if you're in your vehicle and you can wear it wear it but if it becomes um, an obstacle and it gets in your way of you turning your head or looking to a blind stop blind spot don't worry about it you can take it off so your garrison cover for your service Charlies is kind of shaped like a Krispy Kreme hat. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier because you can center it easier on your head and you're going to make sure like always that it's at least one inch above the bridge of the nose. If there is a cover that's easiest to wear, it's this one. For those cadet officers, you will find that the placement of your officer rank on your service shirt is a little bit easier than on your camis because you've got a pointed tipped collar as opposed to a rounded collar on your camis. But all the same rules apply. One inch above the bottom of the collar and it has to be center line of the collar. No distinct difference in the placement between your camis and your service. Now the enlisted ranks are so much easier to measure on your khaki shirt than they are your camis because you, like I said for the officers, have a very, very distinct and pointy collar. The same rules apply. One inch from the sides of the collar and center line on the collar. You've got a pointy tip of the chevron, you've got the center of the lamp, and then you've got the point at the bottom of the collar that's just gonna make your life so much easier. The biggest thing you're gonna worry about is that half an inch on the left and the right side of that chevron. The bottom right edge, sharp edge of the chevron is where you measure a half inch from. Use these slideshows as a reference. If you're putting your uniforms together and you just don't know what you're doing, 
then pull up this PowerPoint, pull up this video, fast forward to the picture that looks like whatever uniform type you have and just follow along with it. You're gonna measure from the bottom corner of the chevron and you're gonna measure a half an inch from that corner. Like always, your, your lamp is gonna face inboard, meaning they, the handles will be towards your shoulders and the spout will be facing towards your chest, regardless of what side it's on. Inboard, inboard, inboard. Our lamp of learning is our PFC Chevron, one and the same, same rules apply. You're gonna measure from the edge of the handle and the edge of the spout, one half of an inch and center lined on that collar. Make sure that the cap of that lamp is centered with a very pointy edge at the bottom of that collar and it is uh, flush, pretty simple. If you're an enlisted cadet, you don't have to worry about this just yet, but when you're promoted to the rank of cadet officer, you're gonna make sure that you have a set of rank insignia ready to be placed on your garrison cover. You're gonna place it at a point midway on the arc of the flap and the flap bisecting the insignia. So if you take a look at the photo, you'll see that the top right corner of that Captain Chevron is in line with that seam as is the bottom left-hand corner of that Captain Bar on the seam. Depending on what rank you have will determine how it's bisecting, but you need to make sure it's very, very center and very, very accurate. This is the side that's opposite of the eagle of an anchor on your garrison cover. Here's some examples of our most common rank insignias. You're gonna make sure that it's equal distance from the top of the body to the bottom of the body. So the rounded top part, the pointy part of your Krispy Kreme hat, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this right here. That's the body. That top thick line and the bottom that rests on your head, that's the body of the cover. You wanna make sure that that rank insignia is equal distance from the top and the bottom. If you'll take a look at the middle, you've got two circles there. That arch is splitting the, the top of the right circle and the bottom of the left circle. And then my captain ranks is splitting that center disc completely. Every one of you are gonna get issued an eagle of an anchor. And that ego of an anchor has to have the anchor facing the front as you're walking. So that anchor should face your nose as you're wearing it. We will most likely only issue you one type of small eagle of an anchor, and that's for the cover. But it's the same type of insignia that's worn on the service uniforms. So we do have it in our inventory where the eagle of an anchors face each other. We have one that goes in the right collar, one that goes in the left collar. Now, the one that goes in the left collar can also be placed on the cover. So make sure that you don't have a backwards eagle of an anchor that actually belongs on a collar. You're going to have a screw plate on the back side that's going to keep it in place. And then behind the head of the eagle, there's a little pointy pokey thing that's going to stick into the material to keep it from spinning around. On the left-hand photo, you'll see the grommet hole that's provided in the cover. You'll take that screw post, put, put it through the grommet, and then screw it in on the backside, and then take that spike and put it into the material. You're gonna make sure that when you wear your eagle of an anchor, that it's parallel to the deck, meaning even with the ground at your feet, not at an angle pointed toward your mouth. Just like your camouflage utilities, you're gonna make sure that the edge of the buckle is aligned with the crotch seam. That is your military alignment, AKA gig line. Just like your camis, you're gonna make sure you got military alignment with two to four inches as a length of that web belt from the buckle to the tip of the belt. Now, when you wear this belt with your trousers for your service uniform, the length may be different than when you wear with your camis because they are a different material. Some are thin, some are thicker. So you gotta be cautious of the measurement. Now here's where those cadets that are LE2s, threes and fours are gonna get hit on an inspection over and over and over again. And that's with our ribbon placement for both males and females. 
ribbons are placed one eighth of an inch from the highest point of the pocket. Not all of your pockets are perfectly flat or parallel to the deck. It really depends on the manufacturer as to whether that top pocket is kind of doing the wave or not across your chest. Ribbons aren't centered on the left pocket. Never put your ribbons on the right side. You'd be surprised. Even Marines do this every now and then they lose their mind. Ribbons are parallel to the deck. All right, so even if your pocket's crooked, you go from the highest point of that pocket as you're wearing the uniform, not as it's hanging on the hanger. There's a difference. Sometimes you may be authorized just to wear ribbons. Other times you may be authorized to wear your ribbons and your badges. If you're wearing both your earned ribbon awards and your shooting badge, you want to make sure that you start with the shooting badge and put that on your shirt first. So, same concept. One-eighth of an inch from the highest point of the pocket and centered on the left pocket. Now, after you've got the shooting badge an eighth of an inch from the highest point of the pocket and centered on the pocket, then you're gonna make sure that that shooting badge is parallel to the deck. Once you get your ribbon badge on, then you're gonna place your, I'm sorry, your shooting badge on, then you're gonna place your ribbons an eighth of an inch above your shooting badge. So if I'm looking at your chest, I should see the top of your pocket, an eighth of an inch above that and centered should be your shooting badge. And then an eighth of an inch and centered above that should be your ribbon. Hopefully this photo right here will make more sense. If you take a look at the left breast pocket, now this Marine has two shooting badges. You will only have one and your shooting badge will be centered on that button of the pocket for the most part, depending on the manufacturer and how well or poor that shirt is put together. The easiest way to measure is to ensure that you've got equal distance from each side of your shooting badge to the edge of the pockets. In order to do that, you just gotta measure how wide the pocket is, how wide your shooting badge is, and you just kinda go left and right, left and right to make sure that you've got the same distance on both sides of that shooting badge. It's gonna be different from person to person because some of you have larger shirts than others. Always start with the highest point of that pocket, then you're gonna go an eighth of an inch above the pocket, to the bottom of the shooting badge, and then another eighth of an inch from the bottom, I'm sorry, from the top of the shooting badge to the bottom of the ribbon. This slideshow, if you reference it regularly, will help you on your uniform inspections. Female ribbon placement on a khaki shirt can be a pain in the keys to the first couple of times because females do not have pockets. However, the easiest way for a young lady to measure their ribbons is from the bottom of the ribbon row and ensuring that that ribbon row is on line or no more than two inches above the top of that shirt. That first button is uh, used for your neck tab, but you're not going to wear those in service C's. So you're going to use the actual button below that to ensure that it's parallel and on line with the bottom of the ribbons. Now, depending on the bust of the young lady will depend on the cut of the shirt. So you're allowed to go up higher than the bottom of that button shown in the picture, but no more than two inches above that top button. Regardless, it needs to be parallel to the deck. Again, not when it's hanging on the hanger. Put your ribbons on, Make sure that they are within the measurement on the hanger, but then put the uniform on your body, look in the mirror, and then see whether or not it's parallel to the deck or not. It will fit completely different on the hanger than it does when it's actually on your body. Just like the male ribbons on a khaki shirt for the males, the ribbons must be equal distance from side to side. However, you don't have a pocket as a female so you're going to use equal distance from the shoulder seam to the button. So if you split the very center of that button where the strings are that sew it on and then go all the way over to your shoulder seam, it should be an equal distance from the button to your ribbons as it is from your ribbons to the shoulder seam. Also like the male ribbons, female ribbons must be parallel to the deck. 
The only way to do that, like I mentioned in the previous slide, is to put it on your body and see how it looks when it's in the mirror. Because it might look perfect on the hanger, but it's not going to look that way when it gets on your body. If you're wearing your shooting badge with a female khaki shirt, then you're going to start with the badge first, just like the males do. So instead of measuring your ribbons parallel to the deck and online with that top button or no more than two inches, you're going to start with the shooting badge and use those same measurements. The bottom of the badge is online with or no more than two inches above the top button of that service shirt. So once you got your badge on there and it's perfect and parallel to the deck, you put it on your body, taking it off the hanger, and it looks good. Then you're going to take it back off your body, put it back on the hanger, and then from the top of the shooting badge, you're going to measure an eighth of an inch, and that's the placement of your ribbon. Here's one that kind of annoys me sometimes when we have mom and dad do our laundry for us or mom sews on of our patches like it's a Boy Scout uniform or something. The Marine Corps JOTC patch is supposed to be one inch below the shoulder seam and centered on the sleeve. Very similar to the way Sergeant Major has his chevrons on when he's wearing his khaki shirt. You're going to make sure that it's creased through the patch with the press of the sleeve. So you're going to have a crease that runs up the length of that sleeve. Well, it should go through the patch. Too many times those patches are flat and then there's a crease below it. You're going to fold that patch in half and, and iron it along where that crease goes. One inch below the shoulder seam. Now, if you're an LE2 or higher and you have service uniforms, then you're going to issue a tanker jacket. This is something that's kind of unique to Mount Juliet High School. Most other Marine Corps Junior ROTC programs will issue the long trench coat. Uh, it's a little bit much for us. We don't have the room. The tanker jackets are a little bit more, okay, they're a lot more expensive, but we believe they're a bit easier to manage. So if you get a tanker jacket, you're going to place your rank on the epaulets. I hope we remember that from previous classes. Your epaulets are going to have your rank insignia placed three quarter of an inch from the shoulder seam to the rank. So if you look at this photo right here, the, the, the part next to the word center is the part closest to your shoulder seam. The part with the little circle is the part closest to your neck. You should be three quarters of an inch and it should be centered on the epaulet, left to right, front to back, up and down. Both officers and enlisted cadets have the exact same measurements for your rank insignia on your epaulets. Here's a little secret though. This is the same measurement that you would use on the epaulets of your dress blue uniforms as well. Three quarters of an inch. Drives me nuts when cadets walk in the classroom and they've got their rank insignia just slapped in the middle somewhere of the epaulet of their tanger jacket. Or they don't have it on there at all because they left a set on their camis, they've got a set on their collar in their Charlies, but they didn't take that set off their camis and put it on their tanker jacket. Don't forget to do that. Do's and don'ts. There are some distinct differences between Marine Corps regulations and ROTC regulations. Because the Marine Corps ROTC program does not have military issued backpacks to provide you, then what we do is we authorize you to wear a civilian backpack in your utility uniform only, aka your cami. So, is a Marine allowed to roll around on base in uniform with a Hello Kitty backpack? Uh -uh, no way. However, we make an exception, and if you are wearing a, a backpack in uniform, then it can only be in camis. If you're issued a service uniform or a dress uniform, then you're not authorized to wear a backpack. You can have it, but it's got to be in your hand and you got to drag it around with you. You can't put it on because of the accessories in the accoutrement that are associated with the dress uniform and the service uniform. That shoulder strap can get caught on your chevrons, on your sleeves, on your epaulets, or on your collar, and it will get hooked underneath there and it'll rip the fabric and uh, damage the uniform. So we don't allow them in service uniforms. We don't allow them 
in dress uniforms, but we do allow them in camis only. Now, these are some sets of rules that apply to both Marines and cadets. Number one, you don't chew gum in uniform, period, the end. You're not allowed to have chewing gum in our classroom anyway, but if you're upstairs on the A floor smacking away at some hubba bubba in our, any version of our uniforms, it's going to be a bad day for you. It looks nasty and it detracts from the uniform. You're not allowed to chew tobacco in uniform. You shouldn't be chewing tobacco at 14 years old as a freshman anyway. Vaping and smoking. Again, you shouldn't be vaping. You shouldn't be smoking cigarettes. Those are bad, disgusting habits anyway. Hands in your pockets. We talk about this a lot in class. I don't care if it's sub-zero temperatures, if there's snow on the ground, and Mr. Freeze has got you wrapped up in his snow blanket. Do not put your hands in your pockets. You are allowed to eat and you're allowed to drink, but while you're sitting down in the cafeteria or while you're standing still near the vending machine or something like that. You're not allowed to walk around with a bag of Fritos in your hand, walking down the hallway eating. It's not allowed. You're not allowed to use your cell phone while walking around in your uniform. We talk extensively about having, let me rephrase that, not having your cell phone in your pockets while in uniform, especially when it goes off or when I see that blinking light through your blouse pocket. Nah, -uh, no way. It looks nasty and it takes away from the good order and the respectful appearance of that uniform. You are allowed to use your cell phone while you're sitting down or you're cornered somewhere, but you're not allowed to walk down the halls just chit chatting on your phone. You are allowed to have a religious medallion. If you wear a religious medallion, it's supposed to be hidden underneath that skivvy shirt. If you're in Charlie's and you got a white skivvy shirt on, I shouldn't see it. If you're in Cammy's and you got a green skivvy shirt on, I shouldn't see that religious medallion. But you're not rolling up in here looking like 50 Cent or Mr. T. I pity the fool who don't wear a gold chain. Additionally, you're not allowed to have anything clipped to your uniform. That includes cases for your cell phones. You're not allowed to clip that thing to your waistband. Most people who clip a cell phone to their waistband are usually my age or older. You're not going to have any pens or pencils in your pockets. If you need to have them in your trouser pocket where they can't be seen, that's okay. I'm specifically talking about your sleeve pockets and or your breast pocket on any of your uniforms. This isn't a 1970s Revenge of the Nerds movie where everybody's got a pocket protector and like 50 pins and pencils hanging out. Not allowed in camis. If you're in PT gear, then you're allowed to have a barrette. When you put your hair up in your service and dress uniforms, those barrettes should be hidden. I understand there's some exceptions, especially if you're letting your hair grow out. You're going to have to put a couple of barrettes in there, but I shouldn't see like 900 of them. Oh, my Lord. This one's going to get you hemmed up here in school. You are not allowed to have earbuds or headphones or any other portable audio device while in uniform. Please do not be the one who's on the bus, leaning against the window, drooling, falling asleep, listening to Inya or Yanni with your earbuds in on the way home. No eccentric eyeglasses. If you got glasses, you got glasses. No big deal. But we're not running around with those giant clown glasses or those giant beach glasses. Not going to be a thing. If it's bright colored, if they're the hot pink or fluorescent yellow Ray-Bans, you're not allowed to wear them. 
the conservative look to the eyeglasses. You're not allowed to wear colored contact lenses unless it's a lens that would normally suit your eye. You're not rolling up in here looking like Catwoman with some contact lenses or like one with like a skull and crossbones because you want to be Marilyn Manson. No earrings either. We've talked about that at length. No earrings, period, while in uniform, males or females. Now, if you have dental work that requires a gold cap or a silver crown, that's okay. What I'm talking about is the big giant fake front teeth that says playa or thug on the front of your teeth. You're not allowed to do that. If it's true, real dental work, then that's okay. And then last, I want to talk about public displays of affection. The last thing I better see while you're in uniform is you up in the commons, in the cafeteria, or on the bus, swapping spit and making out with your significant other. That's just nasty in public anyway, and it's super triple cootie gross disgusting when you're doing it in our uniform. The first thing that's going to happen is somebody's going to see you. They're going to identify you as an ROTC cadet. They're hopefully going to stop you. Then they're going to tattletale on you to me or the major, and then it's going to be a bad day for you. Do not let your parents or your meemaw cut up, chop up, alter, or change any aspect of the uniform. Too many of our uniforms that have been butchered by those who think that they know how to hem trousers take trousers up in the waist, let dress blues blouses out. We spend so much money year after year replacing uniforms that have been butchered by those that they think they know what they're doing. I'm begging you, if you need alterations done to your uniforms, take it to a professional and then take these slides with you so that they know what to do. Now, what is proper fit? Proper fit is the uniform that is worn while at the position of attention. If they are at a rigid position of attention with their shoes on in the alteration shop, then you're going to have a good starting point. Cadets should stand up, but you want to relax a little bit, hanging your arms naturally at the side. You want to make sure that while you're at the alteration shop, you've got your undershirts on, your underwear on, your socks on, and then your dress shoes that you were issued so they can make sure that the trousers are the right length. Don't overfit uniforms in order to prevent growth or reduction at the waistline or the height. Here's what I mean. If you're issued a set of trousers and they're too long, hem them. Do not cut the legs off. If you cut the legs off, then I can't unhem them and then issue them out to a cadet the next year. Don't overfit them. They're not to be turned into service spandex. You got to leave enough room to grow. Every one of my LE1s, 2s, and 3s, whether you want to believe it or not, because you think you're over puberty, you're not. You're still going to grow, and the uniforms need to be adjusted accordingly as you grow. When you go to the cleaners and you're having things altered, make sure you take this slide with you so that that alteration shop knows where they're supposed to be measuring from. This slide provides you a verbal description of everything that was shown in the previous slide. In order to get a proper measurement, you have to pull your trousers up above your waist bone. Our trousers, our uniform trousers are not to be worn like your emo skinny jeans. You're not a hipster. They're uniform. They're similar to khakis. But even your khakis nowadays have a low hip cut, hip hugging design to them. Not the case of our uniforms. Pull them up so that the bottom of the web belt is on top of the hip bone. That will give your alteration shop a good starting point as it relates to how long or short they're going to hem the bottom of the pant leg. The trousers and the hips should be let out enough that the pockets lay flat. If your trousers are too tight in the hips, then your pockets are going to flare out like rabbit ears. The crease in the crack of your behind is where they're going to start 
when they want to let out or take in your hits. Pay special attention to this. The trousers should be a quarter of an inch above or below the welt of the shoe. That's your tolerance. What is the welt of the shoe? The welt of the shoe is where that top portion of the rubber sole meets the patent leather, where that sole meets the actual shoe. Now, where do you want to start? I want to start with the back of my trouser resting exactly on the welt of the shoe. That way, if I shrink or grow, I've got a quarter of an inch tolerance above or below the welt of that shoe. When you go to the cleaners, make sure you're using this diagram for trouser hemming. You want to make sure that this diagram is shown so that they know, they being the alteration shop, that the front of that trouser should rest at the middle of your shoelaces and that the back of the trouser should rest on or a quarter of an inch above or below the welt of the shoe. What do I mean by that? I mean, there's going to be a break slightly over the shoe in the front where your, where your shoelaces are. Now, there is a difference in the tolerance of the heel in the length of the trouser for females, and they have a half an inch above the welt, which is considered acceptable. However, I always would recommend, even to the ladies, that they don't get anywhere near that variation. Stay within a quarter of an inch. It'll keep you from getting slammed on a uniform inspection. The hem of the slats will be from two to three inches wide. That means all the material in the length of that leg that gets folded up underneath when they hem it, the hem needs to be two to three inches. But here's what I'm asking. Don't chop off the legs. If you have a higher hem of three inches or higher, I would rather you just hem it up and I'll take a look. Don't chop it off. Because if your slacks are hemmed up higher than three inches, that's okay because it allows you room to grow, but it allows me the opportunity to reissue those trousers to someone who is of the same waistline as you, but taller than you next year. Because if you chop off the legs at the bottom when you hem them, and then you turn them back into me, I can't issue that same set of trousers to a taller kid next year because they don't have the length to let out of the hem that you took up or chopped off. So let's wrap up this 100 plus slide period of instruction. The most important things that I want you to take away from this period of instruction is that the uniforms should be a matter of personal pride when you wear them to all Marine Corps JROTC cadets. There are only two Marines in this school who have earned the right to wear these uniforms, the senior Marine instructor and the Marine instructor. You, young men and women, are privileged. You have the privilege of being allowed to wear these uniforms. It is disrespectful to the Marines, soldiers, sailors, and airmen who allow us to live a life of freedom to wear those uniforms in any manner that we disrespect them. By your personal appearance, you set an example of what orderliness is and what conformity is to uniform regulations. Your personal appearance in uniform should project the image to others that you are a part of the world's finest JROTC organization. Semper Fidelis, hoorah, and I look forward to your uniform inspection.